Welcome to the latest episode of the Shift with Elena Agar podcast. In this episode, I welcome Alice Draper, who joined us all the way from South Africa, although she normally based in Dubai. Alice shared her journey from a freelance journalist to a successful entrepreneur who ventured into publicity, aiming to make it more accessible for under-recognized entrepreneurs. The conversation delves into the intricacies, intricacies of entrepreneurship, the importance of self-awareness, and the power of maintaining authenticity in the face of public scrutiny. So join us as we navigate through topics such as rejection, resilience, personal branding, and the dynamics of media exposure. And just stay tuned for this episode and more of others to come. As always, let me know what you think. I always welcome your feedback, comments, thoughts, and suggestions. Alice, welcome to the Shift Podcast. Thank you so much, Elena. I'm really happy to be here. Um, before we start recording, you were telling me that you're currently in South Africa, but you typically reside in Dubai. So what are you doing in South Africa? What are you doing in Dubai? How did you get to working with brands and entrepreneurs and, and so on? Tell me a little bit more. Yeah, so um, I am South African and um, I'm living with my partner in Dubai and I'm in South Africa for a month to visit my family. Um, and I started my little business here from South Africa um, back in the pandemic. Um, and yeah, it was really kind of early days working as a freelance journalist. And I struggled to get placements in the beginning because people said that I didn't have enough bylines. Um, I wasn't notable as a journalist. And Instead of taking a very long route of becoming notable, I thought, well, let me get these big bylines now. Even if it's hard in the beginning, I want this credibility early on. So, um, yeah, really, like, my early 20s, like, I think 21, 22, I was writing for HuffPost and Refinery29 because I just kept pitching them until they said yes. Um, and I really kind of built a rejection resilience muscle and didn't let those no's deter me. And... Um, that opened up a lot of doors for me and it's actually how I pivoted to publicity and instead of waiting for someone to tell me that I deserved PR or I deserved credibility, I went after it myself and I think that's really what has informed the mission that the business now has, which is to make publicity accessible for underrecognized entrepreneurs because something I see a lot is kind of waiting for someone to say you, you're you ready for this PR, you deserve this PR and I've had the opposite approach. I've been like, I will get the PR regardless of whether I'm ready or not <laughs> and use that to my advantage. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to dig more into that because I totally understand where you're coming from. But before we do that, I want to take it back. So what did you study? I'm always curious. What did people mm-hmm. study? What did they end up doing? Um, and what kind of, you know, why journalism? Why PR work? What has led you to it? Yeah, so I studied journalism, so not that far off. Um yeah, I studied journalism and I also did an undergrad in politics and international studies. Um, and I always wanted to be a writer. Like I knew from a very young age, I love writing. I love stories. I love um, writing stories. Um, so journalism felt like a natural fit. And in, you know, studying in South Africa, the way that we were trained as journalists was to write for a newsroom. So they really trained us to kind of develop skill set as like an education reporter to write for a newspaper in the education beat. And luckily, because I was really interested in what I did, um, I was simultaneously doing work. I was doing fellowships for American publications, and I could see that what we were being taught did not match up to what the landscape actually was like. Um, Here in South Africa, the journalism kind of industry was dwindling just as it is in the US, but even worse in the US. And I don't know if you know much about journalism in the US, but like there have been tons and tons of layoffs over the last like 10 years. Um, I think a fraction of the people, like number of journalists have jobs now that as they did like maybe 20 years ago. And so that was happening in an even bigger scale in a way in South Africa, where people who still had journalism jobs were also earning almost nothing. And I saw that and I was like, I don't, I don't want that. That's not what life I want for me, for myself. But I met someone who was writing for American publications and had American clients that she also did like copywriting and content marketing for. And she was making money (laughs) like she was making you know a couple hundred dollars for article for an article which at the time I was like that looks better to me than you know getting getting a full-time job for a couple hundred dollars Um, and so I started freelancing in university 
um, and getting my first clients. I got my first um, travel writing job and an editing job and I was doing fellowships and I built my portfolio in university. So, um, yeah, it was not long after leaving university that I actually uh, ended up pivoting my business to publicity. Very nice. Very nice. So what do most people don't know about publicity? What are, what are some like, you know, say somebody who doesn't know anything and or has their own concept or, you know, misconceptions about what it is, what is PR, what is publicity? I think maybe the biggest one is that you don't need fancy skills or a fancy publicist or, you know, um, fancy expertise to start getting publicity. So I think when we say the word publicity, it sounds like something that you would think, you know, maybe a corporation has a publicist. And I think that the regular person like me um, and like perhaps some of the listeners can be their own publicists. And publicity is something as simple as me joining you for this podcast episode today, or it's something like delivering a workshop to five people for your friend's company. You know, Mm -hmm. that is early publicity and you can make a lot of connections out of that. You can also share stuff about what you're doing and kind of get known to other people. You're a bit of an authority in what you do because you're teaching people and they don't even need to know that it's five people you're teaching. Um, Yeah, so I think publicity is not as big and scary as the word can sound. It really is partnerships and those can be on a bigger scale and they can also be on a smaller scale. Mm. You know, I have to be honest with you. I have learned over the years, um, have, having having my own personal brand and so on, but I've also been exposed to things that I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't know this. So I've, I've been yeah. exposed to the fact that when it comes to publicity, in some aspects, it is that. It's like showing up and just like, you know, putting your message out there. But then a lot of it, which is why I think many publications don't really care for unknown people, Um is because typically you can buy into it. So for example, um, and maybe this is not true for all, but I'm curious your thoughts on it. A lot of publications that are like, you know, top 30, top 10 companies, best place to work. A lot of those places got onto those lists uh, because of sponsorships, because a Mm -hmm. company paid to be, to win an award, to win, you know, or like to be awarded something. So whenever I hear people are awarded, unless you're like, I don't know, Nobel Prize, win, you know, like a, a, a peace, yeah. peace Prize or some, something, you know, something that maybe is more, more respectful, so to say. But when I, when I hear like awards and stuff like that and having, have, because I've done that game as well. And I know that mm-hmm. sometimes all it takes is either some money or the right people recommending you. So it's like, I feel like there's a game in PR because it doesn't mean that that's actually an award-winning company or an award-winning person, they just know how to get into that space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. So so that's something that we call in publicity, we call it earned media. I mean, paid media, sorry. Mm-hmm. So I work in earned media, which is um, you, you're pitching and the editor or the podcast host or whoever is deciding whether or not to have you based on whether they think your message is interesting and what you are doing is a fit for their audience. Um, but paid media kind of comes in. And so even like in my work, you ha- have people kind of respond and say, actually, we charge a $5,000 fee for this. Like that was the craziest <laughs> fee, you know, or it could be like $500 or whatever. And um, we just then blacklisted from our lists because we do not doing paid media. So that's just not something our clients are interested in. Um, it's not something that we, you know, are interested in pursuing. But you are right, it exists. Um, and people can pay to get media features. Um, I, as a publicist, can tell when something is paid versus earned, Um, and I personally wouldn't opt for paid media myself because because I can tell, I would think that my clients can tell and other people who I respect in my industry can tell because sometimes you look at these lists and the general credibility of the list is under question because... um, they they're not really remarkable people so if you're amongst a bunch of like kind of unremarkable people in like biz journals 14 entrepreneurs to watch I would think that my audience can tell that this is not really like that credible of a list 
Um, whereas if you're in like Forbes 30 under 30, that holds a lot of weight in the industry because it's competitive, like mm -hmm. because it's extremely hard to get into Forbes 30 under 30 or it's extremely hard to get a TEDx talk. That is why it holds a lot of weight in the industry because people know that this is not just something you can buy yourself into. You may have to pay an application fee, but paying an application fee does not guarantee you're getting a spot and something like that. Um, but it is a game and I know like some of my clients who have really great PR have really great networks and they're recommended into spaces and I think that that even in the space of earned media the game of networks and relationships does exist um, if you know someone in fast company you're more likely to get nominated for a fast company award um, mm -hmm. in my space of earned media for my clients who have been on like book lists it's often because we've kind of established a connection with someone and then they're more likely to be to nominate this client's book because they already know who this client is because they're just getting pitched so much so I think that even in the earned media space that game element is there which is that you you really want to establish connections and such points with people so that they're they actually look at you and engage with you more than anyone pitching them Mm. Yeah, no, I tend to agree on that point in terms of networks. I think building those relationships and that's where it comes in like helpful to have a publicist mm -hmm. because, you know, in your case, you already have some of those relationships. And if you have a client you can vouch for, then you can put some, you know, you can utilize those relationships. Right. So I think that's powerful. And um, I, 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 you know, I've learned about this game over the years and I'm with you on a sense that it's easy to spot if it's, um, mm -hmm if it's paid, you know, and when I, when I get like, and I, I get spammed all the time, you know, like, oh, you're, you were nominated to be top. And I'm like, I know I'm not like, I, <laughs> I, I know myself. And my ego is Sometimes not I perfect. look at the quality of what they have and I'm like, oh my goodness, who would ever believe that? <laughs> like, right? Yeah. That's... I mean, listen, I, I, I've made, I've made, I mean, I've done some things where I'm like, okay, I don't mind to be associated with X, Y, and Z you know, and there's been like, you know, balance between like the Forbes stuff, the TEDx, and then like other smaller mm -hmm. exposures. Um, I th And I'm curious your thoughts, because I think branding, you know, it's like, there's no such thing as bad PR. Maybe there is, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but it's like, I think as long as you're kind of um, putting out con consistent content, and you're sticking to your like authentic self, I think that's where it's, that's probably what the most like, I guess, best way to continue to grow your brand. But I'm curious, you know, your thoughts, like, is there such thing as bad PR these days, considering that it's a very, mm -hmm. like, transit space anyway? That's such an interesting question. And I think you're the first person that's asked me this. Um, so, so, you know, when people think of, I, I don't know, when I'd say to someone, I'm a PR person, they think I'm like fixing people's images, which is obviously not what I do. I, um, <laughs> I pitch them just for exposure so in my world there isn't really bad such thing as PR in the sense of like me pitching someone onto a bad podcast has never been a bad experience for them except that maybe they felt like their time could have been best utilized elsewhere um maybe they felt like that podcast host you know they have a busy schedule and that podcast wasn't a great fit for them um but yeah so so in that sense I don't look at like the stuff that I do is being bad PR, even in a sense of sometimes if someone hasn't built up their brand, they don't have all the pieces in place, they don't have their scalable offer or um, great branding or a lead magnet that can, you know, help them make the most out of being on podcasts or they're really going on small podcasts. I personally am of the belief that that's not bad PR. It's maybe not the most effective PR you could have. Perhaps with a little bit of planning, it could have been a more effective strategy. Um, but, you know, I, I know people who would say, like, as, like a brand specialist might say, that's really bad. You can't go, go on a podcast if your brand is not, like, 100% there. But I'm I'm not a perfectionist. I'm like, you know, start somewhere, you know, don't hold on to have, because otherwise you can wait forever. You can be like, I can't go on a podcast yet because my website's not perfect. And I don't have a like mm -hmm. mailing list that's up to date. And, you know, all these pieces aren't in place. And ultimately, even if, you know, no one is coming into your mailing list from that podcast appearance, 
you are learning how to be a better podcast guest. You know, even if mm-hmm. there's two listeners, you are learning how to interview better because you're practicing the skill. Yeah. You are networking. You're getting to know someone else. Um, so, yeah, so in that sense, like, I kind of look at it as um, as long as there's no major red flags. Like, you don't think that this is, like, going to be terrible for your brand because this person is extremely controversial. Um then I look at kind of most PR opportunities as something that to be taken like to to use unless your schedule is extremely full and you really can't handle it because you have too much else going on. That's understandable. Um, Controversial stuff. I don't know if you want to touch on that. Like I'm not really an expert on that, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah. So like, I think like Jay Shetty, you know, got, got, had that article in the guardian where um he was he you know exposed as lying about being a monk and um a whole bunch of stuff I have no idea actually like I don't know why I brought that up because I have no idea if that's I personally would not want that to happen to me like I wouldn't want my like my brand to go famous because I'm like in a controversial light I think that would be extremely stressful and I don't know if I could handle that um I don't know whether that controversial stuff is good for the brand or not, but I, I guess it's <laughs> it's not really relevant to the stuff I'm doing. None of my clients have been exposed for anything controversial. Um, it's only stuff I've seen in the media with like really famous people like Jay Shetty and um, the Huberman, Andrew Huberman. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know whether that's good for business or not. Um, but I don't know if yeah. that's... Yeah, well, you know, and I, that's an interesting point because, um, I mean, obviously you have to be uber famous for even for it to be even controversial for people to even care about it, right? Like, yeah. But, but, it, but, but I think it brings up a good point because what I was saying earlier, it's about consistency and your brand. And I think your audience, you know, with Andrew Huberman and, and Jay Shetty, like, I think... I think there's always going to be a lot of stories out there. And I haven't seen the Jay Shetty one. I don't know if it's true or not. I, I don't know much, but I like mm-hmm. the content he puts out. Like, I don't, I, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I like part of me is like, I like the interviews he does. And same with Andrew Huberman. Like, I don't care how many, wh- who you date. I really don't. It has not, <laughs> it adds zero. Like, I don't, I, I, it's, that's not why I follow Andrew Huberman. I don't follow him for dating advice. I follow him for the science, mm-hmm. for the neuroscience of it. So I think like, as his audience, for example, right? You know, I know I know the content and I know why I follow him. If he was a dating person or like somebody who talks about dating or some or like, I don't know, uh, faithful yeah. relationships or marriage, then I'd be like, <laughs> okay, maybe it's a little bit questionable, but that's not why I follow him. And I think that's the key, right? It's like, he never, you know, it's like stay on brand. Mm-hmm. He never was like out there talking about, not, not a recall about like dating or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, so I, th- I think it's about, having that authenticity, having that consistent brand, having that transparency to whichever uh, level you're interested in. But I think, you know, because out there in the world, like I think people are very quick to judge and so on. So I think that people who truly pay attention to you, right. And your, mm-hmm. and your brand and mm-hmm. what you're doing, I think like they're, they'll, they'll under, like, it doesn't really matter. It won't phase. So it's like, it comes and goes these stories, you know, and then, the, you know, you got your 10 seconds of fame and then everybody moves on to whatever's next, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed that both Jay Shetty and Andrew Huberman were very quiet throughout it. And that was probably strategic. They probably were like, this will fade this, yeah. uh, you know, things will go back to, to normal. And Probably will, but yeah, I don't really deal in the world of PR crises, so I don't know <laughs> like what that even looks that like. Reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, but I, mean, I wonder if Andrew Huberman has a PR person. I wonder if or I'm sure he, should, he does. Yeah, I'm sure he, does he? He's yeah. that. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. So, so I think I think it just comes down to, to you know that consistency. And another thing that I would imagine people struggle with you know, especially as you're putting yourself out there and if you're not used to it, it's just like that mm. fear of failure, you know, maybe, you know, fear of like, do people even care what I have to say? Because I ask myself that question every week. And so I've decided that I'm going to just do things because I care. <laughs> yeah. I don't care if you <laughs> care. I just do it because I like it. And that's how I want to spend my time. You want to watch it, watch it, you know, watch it, you know, so, but I do ask myself, like, do I, like, do people even care about this? You know, um, but Ultimately, I think it's just making sure that I care. But, you know, how do you help people overcome, you know, that fear of failure, fear of, I don't know, just being out there and talking about things? And what if somebody pulls something up a couple of years later and you're like, I didn't mean to say that or, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. 
I love that you do it anyway, because I think that um, that fear of failure, the only way to really move through it is to do it anyway, because, you know, when we're stuck in that cycle of overthinking, we tend to not do, and then we have less confidence because action, I mean, confidence comes as a result of action. So, you know, the more reps you put in, Elena, with the podcast, and maybe you've seen this, like, have you noticed that the more you're putting out the podcast, the more confident you feel about what you're doing versus like the beginning where you have like no proof of concept? Um, mm-hmm. Has that happened to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so yeah, you well, you know, of... it's a little bit of both, actually. I started to interrupt, but a little bit of both. I think there's part of it is like, I feel confident, but then also I start to know where I lack. So it's mm-hmm. like, it's mm-hmm. it's kind mm-hmm. of like double edge, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 But that, that's learning. That's now you're kind of, as you're doing, you're, you're getting better at it. So you're assessing kind of what needs to change and what needs to be better. But if you were in that space of overthinking of like, I don't know if I have what it takes to be a podcast host. I don't know if I have what it takes to start this thing of my own. And you're kind of in this doom spiral and you never actually do it. You'll never get that confidence. Um, you know, never kind of, no, I wouldn't want to say overcome that fear of failure because the fear of failure is always there. Like as an entrepreneur, I still have that fear of failure and I look at it as almost an asset. Like it's the thing that keeps me moving and it's the thing that keeps me like pushing forward, but it's not crippling. It's not self-sabotaging. It's just something that I'm like, yeah, okay, I acknowledge you, you're here and we're going to keep doing this anyway. Um, So yeah, I think like one of the biggest things is taking action. And um, I think rejection is a very interesting way of, um, overcoming fear of failure in a way because um my, my own story and I don't think I mentioned this yet but um when I was struggling with pitching myself in my early days as a freelance journalist I um would get really derailed by a pitch I kind of thought that that had some kind of bigger meaning on my capabilities as a writer and I came across a Facebook group of journalists freelance journalists who talked about setting a rejection challenge and their challenge was to get to get 100 rejections in a year and these were journalists with a lot more experience than me many of them were writing for the New York Times the Paris Review the New Yorker and they were actively celebrating rejection and that did a full kind of 180 in my brain where I was like oh okay if these people are doing it maybe it's not bad that I'm getting rejected and so instead of seeking acceptances I started setting rejection goals and that's actually where I got my first acceptances from and really What I was doing was building a rejection resilience muscle, which was helping me overcome that fear of failure because, um, yeah, rejection is something that we're hardwired to avoid at all costs. Like evolutionarily, if you're rejected, you have no food, you have no tribe, you kind of maybe have to swim to another island. Like it's, it is really dire consequences. Whereas in society today, rejection in the sense, you know, of pitching yourself and getting rejected has no dire consequences. In fact, I argue that people don't even remember most of the rejections because like who remembers the rejection unless it was offensive. Um, And if we're not normalizing that, we're not actually putting ourselves out there and we're not making asks. Mm. It's an excellent point. I, uh, I think I still probably struggle with rejection just becomes the sting is less and less. It's like, at Mm. first you're like, you know, you're like, you think about it. You're like, why not me? Or like, why not? You know, but now it's like, beep. Okay. Moving on. Like, it's still like, it's like a little, a little slap on the hand, you know, when somebody is like, no, no, or thanks, or, you know, you're not the right fit or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, it, it still stings, you know? And I think that, you know, it keeps you humble. That's why I say like, you know, it keeps you humble. Okay. I'm I'm just not there yet. You know what I mean? It's like, I need to like level up my game a little bit about whatever it is that I'm being rejected from. Um, I'm curious to that point, you know, it's also a lot about self-awareness, right? And in entrepreneurship, in the PR world, you know, or as, as you know, an entrepreneur who's kind of out there, self-awareness is a big piece of just success, I think, in my opinion. And it's, it's an evolving thing that we all have to kind of continue to get to know ourselves in the different stages through different uh, experiences. You know, with that in mind, you know, is everybody meant to be an entrepreneur? Like, how do you, how do you come to a realization? Like, yeah, you know, this is for me or this is not for me. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you asking like in the sense of like if my clients wanted to know are they supposed to be an entrepreneur or not or yeah like I'm just curious, or just like, general advice for the listeners yeah general advice you know like I think entrepreneurship yeah. is such a trendy thing right now and yeah, everybody's yeah. trying to be an entrepreneur and I'm all for it but I think there's yeah. a difference between entrepreneurship small business owner freelancer independent contractor consultant etc but it's all like dumped into one so you know just uh, mm. what are your thoughts on it yeah I mean you're right it's kind of packaged as the most trendy thing and I think that it is so individualistic and as you said you know it, it's it requires a lot of self-awareness and that's the thing that I've loved about entrepreneurship in my journey is the path to self-awareness and like all the stuff I've had to do like figure out your money habits, figuring out like, you know, um, your childhood, how your childhood trauma affects the way you think of money and the way you think of business and stuff. I, as someone who loves personal development, I love that. And I love having agency and I love having control but uh, of my work and what I'm doing every day. But I think that it all comes down to an individual level and kind of getting really clear on your values. Are you someone who really values security are you someone who values family? Are you someone who values um, predictability? If you find that your values fit a job better than doing your own thing, you may find that having a stable, predictable job that allows you to have a great work-life balance, clock off at four o'clock, be with your family is a better fit for you. Um, you know, I can think of people in my life where I think that they're far better suited to having a job than being an entrepreneur. Um, like as it goes to my values I don't really value that stuff as much as I value other things like freedom um, flexibility growth like I, I thrive in unpredictable and in many ways unstable environments so um, yeah so 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 like I, I know that those are my values and so I think that um, we shouldn't <laughs> be quick to kind of jump on the trend and think that because this is the cool thing that everyone's doing it's the thing you should be doing I think it really comes down to who are you and what what are your goals and yeah what are your values and what suits you best mm. what is what is the what do you think um oh uh yeah I think I think I agree with a lot of things that you said um in my thoughts I think that you should try things I think you won't really mm -hmm. know until you try it. Um, yeah, so I'm agreed, all, actually. You know, I think I'm all up for experimentation, but don't stay somewhere for too long just because you think it's trendy, even though it's draining mm -hmm. the hell out of you. Or maybe life circumstances change, and now you need stability, and now you need security. Maybe you became a parent. Maybe you're taking care of your parents. Maybe whatever yeah. it may be. So I think, you know, self-awareness, right? Like where you are in your life right now, you know, what is the right choice right now? And it doesn't mean that you still don't have that entrepreneurial spirit. I think that you can mm -hmm. be an entrepreneur in an organization. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so like one of the experiences that I've had when I had my business and I started business 2019 is I don't really like between my business partner and I, like I realized I was like, I don't really care to manage a team. I yeah. just yeah. don't, I'm not, I can't, I'm, I'm good at it. I can be good at it, but it takes too much of my yeah. energy. I'm good. Yeah, it's I don't, not it's not, but there's nothing fun about it for me. Like I want to do this. Like mm -hmm. I want to actually be engaged. Like I want to be on the ground type thing. Um, and I have mm -hmm. a friend of mine who is, you know, she wants to build like a huge company. Like she wants to, she mm -hmm. wants to leave that legacy. I'm like, I really like what I care about yeah. is like doing something I enjoy, putting out great content, having conversations, you know, just doing what I enjoy. Like that's it. Like creating products, creating services. Like I want to be in the creator side of things versus the admin management like it's just not where I want to spend my energy you know I, I do it because I have to in some capacity but I don't need to have a huge company I don't need to be the CEO I don't need to be a founder or co-founder and etc you know I just mm -hmm. like I, I don't I don't need that and I think and I didn't know that before so when I start I was like yeah. I'm gonna have this great company it's gonna be huge and I was like that's not who I am and I think and it took yeah. me a while to be like oh that's not who I am I need to let that yeah. go yeah, I love that. And I mean, like the theme of what I'm hearing is self-awareness is important in every space, whether you are an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur or an employee. Um, and I completely agree with you with the trying new things and being willing to let go of things when they're not working for you anymore. 
I actually never saw myself as an entrepreneur, but I realized that I was making more money freelancing than a full-time job could offer me. And so I just financially was like, I don't want to take a pay cut to work longer hours. So I will try my hand at, you know, doing my own thing. And then I kind of evolved into like from a freelancer and an entrepreneur and I just loved every step of the process. So I would never have known that if I boxed myself in and wasn't willing to try something. So I love that you said, you know, be willing to try things and see what fits for you um, and change course if it's no longer working. Hmm. Do you think everybody should have a personal brand? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that it is helpful to have a personal brand, regardless of whether you are running your own business or you're um, working a job. And, you know, my best friend works a job and her boss was encouraging her to post on LinkedIn for kind of the client facing stuff. And she was complaining about it. She was like, oh, you know, like who wants to post on LinkedIn? And this is like so boring and so pointless. And I said to her, this is an amazing opportunity. You know, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do. And I was like bouncing off ideas because she had it in her head, like she just needs to share. Like I went to this event or this webinar, this company webinar is happening, like really boring LinkedIn posts that would not really, you know, be interesting to her or even her viewers because if, if, if we're, we find the thing we're writing boring people probably find it boring to look at and I was like you know you can share these sort of I like came up with the things she was really passionate about and I was like you can share stories around this you can share stories around stuff you do with clients and she got really excited and she's been posting on LinkedIn and the benefits of that are huge because you have visibility to other people you have visibility to other companies other leaders, leaders within your own company, you know, she has the CEO talking to her about the stuff she's creating. And I mean, that's this ability to get yourself promoted to um, grow in the company. So I think that there are tons of benefits from building a personal brand, as long as it's something that, you know, you want to do. And I think that's the most important thing. If you're not having fun with it, then I don't think other people are going to really enjoy what you're posting. So Figuring out, like, what do you like? Do you like writing? Do you like videos? Do you like podcasting? Um, If there are things you like creating and you can create that stuff, I think it's a great, a great idea. Yeah, you brought up a good point about finding, like, finding your platform. Um, I remember Mm -hmm. when, um, like, TikTok blew up and people like, you should be on TikTok and you should do this. And I'm like, and by that, luckily, I have self enough self awareness to know that I'm awkward and things like TikTok. Like, I'm just not like I'm just it's not my thing I struggle with reels Mm -hmm. even on Instagram like I don't post a lot of like too much stuff I post things where I feel comfortable but I think that that's the misconception people have is like you have to be everywhere and it's like no no just find your audience find your Mm -hmm. area find your uh, comfort zone in, in in a way that's and I don't mean comfort zone like don't do something because you're uncomfortable you know don't don't do something because you know, this, you're going to look ridiculous. I'll give you an example. I see a lot of people in my field, like that would go on TikTok. And I'm like, like, I know who you are. Like you should stick with LinkedIn lives or, you know, (laughs) or like, you know, or written or, you know, podcasting and so on. Right. Because they just look awkward and they look silly. Like they look silly Mm -hmm. and you, and you know, and you like, you like, you're not even being authentic because you feel like you have to be on these platforms. And I mean, luckily for me, I, 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 I know how awkward I am. And like, I haven't like, no, I've just, I don't, um, I can't do these short things. I'm a long form person. I'm not, you know, my thought process is very dragged out for better or for worse. It's just, mm-hmm. it's who I am. Like, you know, people either align with yeah. it or they don't. Um, but I think it's important to, to find that platform that works for you. Yeah, I completely agree. And I mean, you know, just as you said, you're more of a long form person. I think that short form so the struggle I see with a lot of people is they feel like short form is too limiting it's it feels like you kind of have to do a TikTok dance and if you're not a TikTok dancer you can't accurately portray your stuff and I think then you can play with long form you know writing LinkedIn articles if you're a writer doing LinkedIn lives if you're a talker um you know as you know Lena starting a podcast is a big thing and it's not something that anyone can do but you can do other things like lives um LinkedIn lives Instagram lives um There's ways of kind of being a talker, even if you're not ready to put that um, like investment in or commit to something as big as a podcast and experiments, you know, like um, those people who 
you know, you said that's awkward on TikTok. Perhaps they wouldn't know they were awkward if they didn't try. So, um, yeah, I just just like you said with um, yeah. jobs and entrepreneurship and stuff is, um, you know, try out your hand at things. And like, even if you start a TikTok account and post three videos and realize it's not for you, that's okay. <laughs> like, yeah. chances are not a lot of people saw those three videos and you can move on and I think that was the biggest mistake I made in my first year of entrepreneurship because I thought I had to be everywhere I thought I had to be on, on TikTok on Clubhouse like you know now Clubhouse has come out so I must be on Clubhouse all the time and like I think I just would have had a far more effective strategy if I just picked one or two places and then just focused on getting things right there instead of trying to be everywhere yeah thank you for saying that by the way I do you know I I, I do think people should experiment but I, you know I think just as long as like experiment yeah. but don't like stick on it too long like if, you know so, yeah you know exp- but also like experimenting like self-awareness like is this like did mm-hmm. this experiment work like you know so anyway yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's yeah. a personal opinion of mine obviously it means very little yeah. but um it's just my observation I guess of uh of, yeah. of some 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 things that I've seen in my in my industry um, but it's a good point because I think, you know, being too rigid about a plan is not a good thing. And if you decided, oh, today, this year is the year I'm going to be on TikTok and TikTok's just not working. You're not getting views. You're not getting engagements. The stuff you're doing on LinkedIn performs way better. It's a good thing to not be rigid about that plan and be like, actually, we are pivoting to something else. And I think I, I say the same with pitching. You know, I teach people how to pitch themselves to podcasts and I'm like, If you are getting no results, it's time to assess, one, are you pitching the right podcast? And two, are your pitches good? Like Mm -hmm. we, you know, we don't want to keep doing something that's not getting you the rewards it should be or the um, results it should be. Even though I encourage rejection challenges, we should still look at the numbers and see where things need to change. Yeah, excellent point. Um, Before I ask you my last question, where can people get in touch with you? Where do you hang out at the most? I hang out most on LinkedIn. <laughs> so I'm I'm a writer. <laughs> um, so yeah, so LinkedIn and I have a newsletter where I share podcasts that are currently accepting guests and I also share my own writing. Um, it's kind of rejection focused. Um, yeah, so if you search me, Alice Draper on LinkedIn and if you, my website, Hustling Writers forward slash templates has a podcast pitch template and five tips on how to pitch podcasts that you can download for free if anyone listening wants to pitch themselves to podcasts. Nice. I'm going to make sure to include all that in the show notes. And the last question I ask all of my guests is, what is one question you wish people would ask themselves more often? Ooh, this is fantastic. And um, let me think if there's something I... (laughs) think do I want this and I think it kind of ties the theme of what we've been talking about you know at the point you made earlier Elena about um whether you know reflecting on whether something's working for you or not and being willing to let it go and what I was saying about being too rigid I think um a great question to ask ourselves in all areas of our lives is do I want this because I I I too am guilty of kind of doing things just because it's I'm on autopilot or I've been doing it for so long or I never really thought about doing things differently but um reflecting and being like do I want this is this still aligned to what I want to do can help us let go of things and you know it's we always feel like we have too much on our plate and it can be helpful to let go of things so I think that's a way to do that beautiful well Alice thank you so much for your time thank you so much Elena this was really fun Mm -hmm.